Okay, welcome back. Um, we finally got the slides uploaded. Um, and we're going to start with a, a presentation by, by Chris. Uh, Chris and Holger have been working on um, a hazard index approach for determining the cumulative exposure to phthalates using uh, biomonitoring data. And so we want to walk through this and uh, open up uh, discussion among the committee members. Chris? So I'd like to start by saying this is just draft form, so please keep that in mind um, as we go through this. Sorry, what do I do? Oh, on the top? Sorry. Okay, I'm pushing arrows. What's happening? Oh, I'll do that. Ah, there you go. Okay. So, okay. So, just to remind us, um, the form of the hazard index is given here. Uh, and so what we're going to do is to estimate the daily intake from NHANES data on a per subject basis. So we'll kind of step through um, the, that approach uh, using some uh, work that uh, Holger has done. Um, the reference doses we're actually going to look at in uh, two different ways, case one and case two. Case one is going to be based on the approach um, that uh, Andreas presented to us uh, on our first meeting and then a second approach um, that we kind of put together. Okay, so our objective is, again, to look at the distribution of the hazard index. So, again, the approach is going to be not to um, estimate the daily intake at, at the median level or the 95th percentile, but it's on a per subject basis what their real exposures were um, as estimated um, uh, from their metabolites. So, we're, we're going to start this in two ways. The first way uh, or the first thing we did is we included um, seven different phthalates. It's the six phthalates, but we added the, um, the diisobutyl phthalate, uh, which is not, I think, on the list of our six. Um, and then we're looking at additional um, androgen, um, anti-androgens, um, the bisphenol A, butyl paraben, and propyl um, paraben. Again, the, um, there may be others that we should add, but this is just a demonstration of what we could do. Um, to add additional chemicals to see the effect of additional chemicals besides just the phthalates. Okay, so we're going to use the NHANES 2005 and 6. Now, from the discussion this morning, I'm wondering, um, should we actually go back and do this on the 2003 and 4 data um, because of the fasting? I mean, that may be something that we can think about. Um, right now, we're looking at 6 to 19. It's really less than 19 years old, so we're trying to focus on the children. Um, and then the two cases, like I, like I described before. Okay, so this is the, the meat of the, of the work, is um, the work from um, uh, Holger has done, calculation of daily intake from these different metabolites. So um, maybe I can just put, hit, hit some highlights here, and Holger, if you want to add things to that discussion. Um, so the daily intake is estimated from... Uh, Well, anyway, from the um, urinary excretion estimates um, that come from uh, the actual metabolite values that we can measure from NHANES, uh, the smooth creatinine excretions, we're doing this for children. So there's this paper, Reamer et al., um, so that the um, creatinine excretion rates are based on height and gender-based references for the smaller kids. Um, and then we have this um, uh, tabular molar ratio of metabolite excreted. So this uh, fraction excretion, excretion frac factor we're going to look at, but some of these values we actually took from the literature, others we just sort of set because, again, just to push the exercise through, and if, if we could get more information about those values that you set, I'll show you a table of that in just a minute. The body weight is given for an individual child. Molecular weights um, uh, we can calculate as well. Okay, so this is um, the list of the... Of the um, phthalate monoesters that we use, they're categorized by the components that would go towards a, a, a parent compound. 
Um, and so these are the excretion factors that we used. Some of these are set at 10%. So if we could get informed values there. So essentially what we do is, um, uh, for example, for um, DEHP, the, uh, these would be summed um, to get a total for um, that, for that parent compound. Um, so we're going we're gonna to use these values in our calculations. We also have some values here that we're assuming um, for these um, other anti-androgens. So we're going to look at this as a case with the phthalates and then with these additional, so dif a different um, case in addition to that. Okay, so this is a place that we could come back and re-inform re what we're doing. Okay, so I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but the second case here is, is where we looked at some of the work by Earl Gray and, and made some assumptions and we said, um, suppose that we assume that these four are um, at least approximately equipotent and we look at the literature and find a no AL for DEHP of five um, and then use a relative potency approach to get to the DINP um, value. Uh, when you do that, and these are now values that were um, published in this paper um, that we'll see in the next slide. Um, so the, the, this side of the slide is essentially what's in um, uh, Andreas's paper. Um, I think we set these. That wasn't in on, the, those were not considered in, in that paper. This is the second case where we assumed the equipotency and then we got to um, RFD values there. Um, And I guess the DEP we set at 800. And I, standing here, I can't remember what, how we got the 800. Um, but so some of the details, maybe we can go back. I don't want to belabor that, but some of the details here, maybe we could reconsider. Uh, okay. So, so again, the approach is if we if we could look at fixed reference levels, reference doses, uh, and then on a per subject basis estimate. Uh, what their daily intakes are for each of the, of the phthalates that we're looking at or the uh, antiandrogens that we're looking at and then come up with a hazard index per subject and then look at the distribution across subjects. Um, and we can, I think a, an advantage of this approach is we can actually kind of go in and simulate things that, with the lack of data that, we're, that we know we have here. I think this approach is going to address um, variability um, across the, the population of kids that we're looking at. Again, this is not weighted with the NHANES uh, weights. These are just the values, which I think some of the other uh, speakers did this morning. But the particular subjects that are here, we're looking at, it was uh, 950 kids uh, aged less than 19 years old, uh, just 12 to 9, you know, 12 is the youngest that NHANES measured. 52% uh, were 6 to 12. 48% are boys. Um, the race, um, remember in NHANES, it's spiked. It's not just representative. Um, and so it, you see the, the percentages are there. Okay, so what this is then is the, the going through this calculation, like I pointed out, on a per subject basis. So it's like every child had their own hazard index estimated from the daily intakes. And what you see is a distribution of the hazard index here. It's, you know, it's off to the right or left, whichever way you're looking at it. Um, the values here you know, may not be able to read. I can barely read them. The, the mean is like 0.18. The median is 0.08, I think. Um, the maximum is 6. Okay. When I take the log base 10 of those values, you get the distribution here. So now the you know, what's one there is zero here. So we see that we are, you know, in the tail, we're beyond, you know, if we're concerned about one as a cutoff. I don't know that we've actually identified that that's the point where we're mainly concerned if we like it, you know, I think one is generally what people are compared to. Um, okay, so this is now the case where we use the reference doses from the Camp and Faust mm -hmm. paper. Um, so then the question is, what happens if we change the reference doses? Does it change the distribution drastically? So this next picture, these are the distributions now from that case too. So now the reference doses have changed slightly. Um, but we still see, you know, um, 
somewhat similar um, shape and the tail part being above one. Um, the maximum value now is much bigger. Instead of six, it's 14. I don't know if we want to worry about that. Um, okay. Now this, this is an interesting slide, I think, that we can kind of look at. If, and let me see if I can teach you what, what's here. So if you think about an individual child has um, their own hazard index, so you can go back and figure out, well, what's the percentage of that hazard index that came from DBP or that came from DEHP or that came from whatever. So there's a percentage per child from their hazard index. Okay? What you're looking at here is like the average percentage across the subjects. But, but I think this part is also interesting, the max and the min. I think what it's telling us is, although in case one, 72% Sorry, the average um, DEHP on a per child basis was a 72% of the hazard index. However, there was somebody with only 11%. There was somebody with almost all from DEHP. Okay? I think this gets to the variability that we, that, that we were talking about, about earlier. Um, interestingly, when we change from case one to case two, what we see is that it's DEHP still ends up being the highest percentage, but now DINP ends up showing up more. Um, and we're, you know, th this range I think is just amazing that on the average it might be DEHP and DINP are the most um, common in terms of the hazard index, but we're seeing children there that have the, the complete range. Um, for each of the chemicals. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, we can come back to these tables, but I think these tables can be helpful because we can actually now simulate, um, you know, scenarios of if we alter some of these exposures, what happens to the uh, hazard index and things like that. So I'll show you a little bit of that um, coming up. But I'm assuming you guys will ask me questions if I stumble too fast. Okay. Okay, so now, and then the other thing we can do is look to see, well, who, who are the children that have these extreme values? So this is on the log 10 scale, the hazard index, and uh, what you're seeing is the, um, from case one, uh, these are across the uh, males and females. This is across the, um, the race. You may not be able to read that. Mexican-American, other Hispanic, non-Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, black, and other. Um, so here again, the zero would be the, the reference line that would be corresponding to a hazard index of one. So we're seeing, um, you know, just about in each of those groups, we're having um, children above a value of one. And here it is broken down from males and females across the, the races. Um, and then here's the age group. So the younger children tend to have um, larger values. Um, this again is on the log 10 scale, um, but you can see the distribution is, is up a, a bit there. Okay, so this is now where, where we can start to play with, um, with what's there. Actually, well, let me see. Back to case one, now if we add um, the other three uh, andro anti-androgens. So it's not just the phthalates, now we're adding three additional ones. And this is the thing that concerns me is three is just a very small number based on what that could be. And I don't know how far you go and you keep adding. I mean, you keep adding, it's going to get bigger. Um, so th the distribution, you know, uh, I think that the mean before was like 0.18, is that what I said? Now it's like 0.207, so it's increased a smidge, not drastically, but it is increasing, which I guess you would expect if you add more chemicals to the, to the assessment. So the planning of what's going to be in here, I think, is going to be an, imp an important step. Um, okay, so now thinking about um, the fact that, the, that these are children 12, 12, to, 9, 12 to 19, um, Sorry, 6 to 19. Sorry, I said that wrong. So but what we don't have are children less than 6. So we said, well, suppose there are behavior patterns or whatever for these children. Could we actually 
try to simulate what would happen to children lower than, than um, um, six. And so we, we just said, and this could be better informed, but for example, we could say, suppose that um, there's an, a 50% increase in the d daily um, intake for DEHP based on behavior of mouthing or whatever. Um, so what happens there? So the 50% the came from a, a paper that um, uh, Holger had published, so that didn't come right out of the air, but maybe this would, could be informed with other chemicals as well. So with that kind of a hypothetical case, we're saying now suppose this is now the daily intake for children smaller or younger than uh, age um, six. And so now the, you, we can look again at the, at the distribution and we, and we see that it, you know, it's, it's increased again from um, uh, up to 0.239 as a mean. Um, and again, you know, the distribution is still over the value of one. Um, and this is now the case where we said now sup if we could study some kind of a substitution effect. So we said, well, suppose um, DINP is actually substituting for DEHP and DEP is substituted for DNBP. Okay, now, now how realistic that is, I, you know, we need to be informed about that. Um, but so we just essentially changed values from DEHP to DINP and recalculated things. Um, and these are values that have lower, uh, uh, or, or I guess higher, reference doses. And so now you see the distribution has actually shifted in the direction we'd like for it to be. So the, the point of this is, this may not be a perfect example of, of how to do the substitution, but I think it is a way of saying we might be able to, with the right input, be able to simulate what would the effect be, or what could the effect be, um, and see, you know, how far that could, we could really make it shift down the direction that we want it, want it to shift. So there's still a lot of work to be done on this. I, I don't want you to think that this is a, a complete story, but I think the advantage of this is we do get to see variability from relevant real exposures in, in children um, that, you know, we can do some simulations in terms of uh, scenarios that we, where we may not have complete data. We might be able to say, for example, suppose, you know, each of these chemicals, a certain percentage comes from food and the other percentage comes from certain products. Um, what's the effect of the, ha you know, how much of the hazard index is actually based on the food part versus the other part? And, you know, so we can look at things like that by having um, this kind of, you know, simulated case. Of course, there are a lot of pitfalls. I just quickly just wrote down that, you know, we haven't corrected here anything for fasting. We can try to do that. We, we need more accurate inputs, and there's probably a whole lot of other, you know, pitfalls. But, you know, from a, from a case where we don't know much, maybe this is an approach where we can start playing some, simulating some. That's that. Okay. So now discussion. Jump in. There are a couple things that I like about this. One is that the first is that you're not uh, adding up the 95th percentile of, of each phthalate because that's probably a, a way overestimating risk. You're actually getting the 95th percentile of the total uh, end result of exposure to multiple phthalates. The other um, uh, and uh, that's the main thing, um, uh, the main advantage of this. Um, but the other other thing is that we don't really know uh, if people's exposures to different phthalates are correlated or not. Um, but you can, it, well, your analysis doesn't require us to assume that they're independent or correlated. It's just, it's what the data are. Um, uh, on the other hand, you can maybe test that. I, I'm not sure we need to do it, but it might be of interest to know, uh, to look at the data in, in 
tease out are the, the different phthalates correlated? Because that's, I think, something came up in interpreting the epi studies. Um, you know, one possible confounder uh, or in one of the, um, one of the curious findings was that ethyl phthalate <coughs> correlated with uh, uh, some of the health effects, but it's ethyl, diethyl is not active in the animal bioassay. So the question is, is it really the diethyl or is it the, the other, it, or is um, the diethyl just a marker for total phthalate exposure or something like that? So there's, there's a lot of things about this. Uh, a lot of advantages, and it could be applied if we do modeling of exposures. It can be applied to that. Yes, great. Thank you very much for this helpful paper and helpful presentation. Um, my question follows on from Mike's remark, um, but just maybe the answer is clear already, but just to make this absolutely clear. The <coughs> ANAINS database allows us to see what the uh, urinary levels of phthalate, of multiple phthalate metabolites are in one and the same urine sample. Is that correct? Yeah? Yes. Correct. Good. Mm -hmm. Then then that is indeed, that's indeed a really mm -hmm. a strong point. Uh, a strong point. The, um, <coughs> the only question I have relates to the um, potency values which you took from uh, Grace data in your case number two. Um, if, if you wish, yeah. Uh, just to, to see. Um, they are based, you say, on suppression of fetal testosterone synthesis. Do you, do you have an explanation for the differences between uh, case one and case two? Right. I should probably know myself, but <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I, I, as far as I remember, what, what Earl's uh, Grace studies are, they <clears throat> they are not designed to derive points of departure. That, that's not a criticism. It's not intended to be a criticism of Earl's work. It's just he would admit that freely himself. So um, that means that if someone went away and did a guideline study uh, with sufficient numbers of animals on with that endpoint, the estimates for point of departures would go down. Um, anyway, so, but this is uh, interesting to see that your estimates went down, but um, what, uh, can you well, just be, give a few details of our Grace study which you based this on? Or, I, well, I think it actually came from uh, some testimony, the, the equipotent part came from a testimony. Um, the five came, I don't remember what, Holger, do you remember where the five came from? <coughs> so first of all, the, both cases have their pros and cons. Mm. And the studies you used basing your point of departure upon, they also are in study design they have considerable differences. I know, yeah. yeah. So that's the drawback on, on, <laughs> on the case one side. On the case two side, so that's major, mainly the, the studies by Earl Grey, um, they are based on this uh, multi-dose uh, mm. EPA approach. And as you said, uh, they are not really designed to derive a TDI or um, let's say a point of departure. Mm. But um, the findings, at least from the effective doses, show that, and this is also the result from 
last uh, sessions or last uh, meetings or a grace presentation that he considers these phthalates as roughly equipotent. So that this is this has been, let's say, a rather provocative approach on our side to present this rather, let's say, differing data or basis data. Um, but we thought um, it, it's just an illustration how potent the approach is that we can, as soon as new data is present, implement this data instantly and have a look what's coming out. Well, and I think interesting too, the, the distribution of the hazard index didn't change, it didn't like move an order of magnitude to the left or the right with very different values, I think, here. Yeah. Now, no, what, the, the thing that changed the most, I think, was the distribution of which of the components was playing the major part. But the index itself was about in the same. Yeah. I'm quite happy to see this, and uh, I don't want to, I don't think it's worth um, <coughs> uh, me, me waxing lyrical about this. I mean, we've said in this paper ourselves that very likely our uh, potency estimates are not conservative enough, and uh, I guess what you've done uh, bears this out. Yeah. But, but well, I think, I, I, you know, it might get to the point that maybe the, Maybe I don't want to overinterpret what Tom was saying, but the whole issue of, you know, are you going to spend a lot of time worrying about tweaks here and there? What we're seeing is the robustness of, you know, the index didn't change that much to two very, very different places. I think that. Um Try. My, my very last question is uh, in the light of uh, this morning's debate. Uh, did you, I don't think, did you uh, adjust those data for fasting or? I, 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 when, I, when we worked on this, I didn't know how to do that yet. Okay. Um, and I'm still, you know, I, I think I'd be up for suggestions about how to do that. Again, you know, maybe what we can do is to present this in multiple ways, <coughs> adjusting for fasting, not adjusting for fasting, adjusting in different ways, you know, what happens to the index um, at, at the end of the day. Um, anti antigens yeah. but I think from this morning's presentations we can uh, conclude that we have to incorporate a an adjustment factor of at least, let's say, two or three. So we are, in other words, with this presentation here, not dramatically, but <coughs> significantly underestimating exposure. I think well up, up one, uh, well larger than one with your hazard index then. Yeah. So, but see, that's my question. So for the, for the folks who have a very short fasting period, is their value <coughs> actually pretty good. It's only the people who have fasted a long time where we may be underestimating. Is exactly. that true? Yeah. And so, we have and seen we that especially the high values, the upper percentiles, are influenced by fasting. I think that's both what Matt showed and what Rick showed. So if, but if we went in and said, you know, for, I mean, I mean, there's multiple ways of doing this, but suppose we went in and said if you have a fasting time bigger than four hours or eight hours, you know, whatever the number is, we're going to increase the exposure estimate for some of those chemicals that are based on food by, right? So, I mean, that's, those are the kinds of steps that I think, you know, if we could agree how to, how to do that, I, I think that would be helpful. Let, let me try to walk through this as a, as a risk assessor. These are based on animal studies, which are feeding studies, I think, or are they gavage? I think they're feed, and, the, and so those doses, your point of departures and so on, are based on average daily exposures. And with the NHANES data, the thing about the um, adjusting for fasting, if, yeah, if the people have fasted, their metabolite levels are going to be lower, but if, 
if you're going to compare to average daily value. What you really want for menhanes, I think, is the average daily exposure. And uh, so when you adjust for fasting, I mean, are you adjusting to get the peak exposure or are you adjusting to, to get the average exposure? Um, I think the the first point I think we can agree on is that no matter no matter which approach we choose, this data is underestimating expo exposure. If we are underestimating peak or mean exposures, we might have to talk about. But we definitely are underestimating exposure. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that we are probably more dramatically underestimating exposure if we look at the upper percentiles. That has been the data shown by Rick and uh, the data by Rick and There are two more points I would like to put the focus on. Currently our investigation stops at the age of six. So we'll have to extrapolate the data to children younger than six. And the data currently does not include pregnant women. That's only children. But there are no pregnant women in Enhanes, is that true? No. But we have, let's say, adult data, or we have data of women in their reproductive age. So You're saying we do, or...? I think we don't, we don't have Haines? actually pregnant women in there, but we have oh. women in their reproductive age in Enhanes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Which, in a sense, may be just even more important. Exactly. But, I mean, we do have... There's not a lot of data, but there are some smaller studies where you have uh, younger children and uh, pregnant mothers or their mothers, and um, I think we should look at those data before we start extrapolating. Or, um, but we should take a, um, a uh, get all those data together and take a close look at that. That's that. That's what I was going to say. Also, there's there's probably four or five data sets that would have maybe data on I would guess two thousand pregnant women, and um, maybe a hundred data points on children less than three or five. I think. And, and what kind of data? Phthalate data? No, no not in Anna Haynes. These are other publications that um, you know, like. Children's Centers, Columbia, or um, other groups, Mount Sinai and others, have published on phthalates in pregnant women during different trimesters and looked at outcomes. And I'm aware of, I think, at least three or four papers that have, have done that. And in, in those papers, there are spot samples. They don't ask the subject to fast, but they also don't ask the subject when their last meal was or how long they were fasting or the time between their last meal and the sample. So, so that data, I'm sure, Hoga, you're, you're familiar with that too. Yeah, I mean, to have any data on uh, children three and under is, would be uh, extremely helpful. Yeah, well, even maybe since then, but we might need to ask them for the raw data because for this approach we need the age, yeah. body weight and height of the children, which we, is on an individual basis. We, so, we can definitely ask yeah. and I think there's a pretty good chance that someone will share those data. My question is really for Mike. A anticipating what you're going to be saying later on this afternoon, <clears throat> do the data that you have fit into this approach 
to help inform us of our answers, our, our recommendations? Well, I, I think it complements this. It's, it's the bot, you know, this is the top down, and yeah. I'm going to talk about the bottom up. And I think they're complementary, and I think you need both. Um, you know, one thing with the, mm -hmm. the children, uh, it, people do see higher levels, metabolite levels in the children than the adults. And the question is, why? Is it because they eat more? Or some people think it's because they mouth toys. Um, but pound for pound for pound, they probably eat more too. And, you know, so um, that, that's something we want to get it, would like to get a handle on. I think, uh, well, the, the estimates in terms of daily exposures, the estimates we made for the toys are, are fairly small. Um, but I'm not sure how they, uh, uh, you know, what percentage of the total they account for. Um, uh, the problem with making those kinds of comparisons is if you have good data for one source and not so good data for another source, those percentages could move around a lot. So, um, but we can certainly try to do that. What kind of units are they in? Would they, oh, be, well, would meant, they be comparable to this? Well, for, I'm talking about, uh, well, micrograms per kilogram per day, or, you know, we could do micrograms per day. So, so you could actually say the based on mouthing or based on exposure to is that what you have on a well, per what, yeah, child what we basis? Did is, what the, well, what we did is made uh, population estimates for uh, infants just mouthing for mouthing the toys. We estimated the daily exposures and per, we, per parent compound. Uh, well, we only did it for one, but yeah, per parent compound. We only did it for one, but we can extend that to, to the others. So that would actually give us a, at least an estimate of a percent. It would be an, an estimate of what the exposure is from using the to from mouthing toys. And I think that would be helpful. Yeah, because it could be compared yeah. to that. <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's an, it's an estimate. I mean, this is hard data. And what I'm talking about is a, is a model based on data. A model based on laboratory data. But combining that with... I thought we were able to come up with percentages based on food per parent compound, right? Is that true? Pretty, pretty accurate, Matt. I'm looking at you. Some have, uh, you know, that can be done. I think Clark. I don't. I didn't see her paper, but that she. I think she did that, and then I could certainly do it for using the ACC database. But for example. The exercise I did with DEHP suggested a large percentage was due, and you could come up with that percentage, and you could probably continue that exercise with other phthalates and get an estimate. Again, I don't, you know, without any kind of validation, you're just using what you have and you don't have from that database the consumer product inputs. People, well, yeah, well, that's the idea is to come in from both ends mm -hmm. and see how they match up. If the bottom up, if there's a gap, it may mean you're overlooking a source, um, uh, but not necessarily. Um, you know, the the Warmoth is, I think, the best example where they did both, and they came up with estimates of how much comes from food and other other things. But they their estimates, um, nothing's uh, uh, they're not hard numbers. Paul, can you see any other strategies that or information that 
Kristen Holger could use to form us bottom up. And, and how would we, I mean, are you talking about generating new data? No. no. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Or, or possibly expanding it a little bit. That's what I was getting at. You don't know of any other sources of data that we might be able to tap into. Well, that's that's what we need to know. That you know, you're the expert in that area. So if you say there's nothing else out there, then feel more comfortable. Paul, from your experience, would you also advise us to look at each of the late individual or at the 95th percentiles or maximum values? on their own and add them up because that would end up in a similar approach as you are suggesting adding up individual roots of significance can lead to problems we know that adding up the 95th percentile of numbers that may not have any coherence mm -hmm. can lead to vast uncertainty i think the first thing to do is in the same types of phthalates. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, my apologies. Um, I think doing it individually first is probably the wisest way. And then you can always then go back and decide to sum it based upon the data we get from Michael's group and others about what, in what products you find certain or all of these same phthalates. Rather than doing it blindly at the 95th percentile, I think you have to be a little cautious. Um, yeah, I, I think the universe <clears throat> of phthalates and toys is is a little narrower. Um, I, I mean, it, well, it's always changing, and, and it de depends on how broad you uh, cast the net, but. The, the toys we looked at um, ten years ago, they were it was one phthalate. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, a a a handful of phthalate substitutes, but it's it's not a big universe. So that at least with these products, I don't think you have to worry too much about adding 95th percentiles. That's only if you try to be inclusive and look at food and all the other sources. Looking at the data, we'll be able to make better judgments. You know, we can have a conversation based yeah. upon facts. But, but it's something that it's, I think it's possible to, <clears throat> in a scenario-based exposure, um, a ground up, it, I think it's possible to do something similar to what you're, you're proposing, where you, um, you, you take that into account. You do a probabilistic approach. Sure. And I think it's reasonable. Two other comments. <clears throat> One, in the spirit of the Silver Book that we heard,
heard about this morning and have read about, I assume colleagues of ours would see that this is a, that the approach is a forward-looking approach consistent with the recommendations in there of ways to do this that are looking toward improvement of methods rather than stepping back and using old methods. The other comment, or the other one is a question, <clears throat> and that is considering what would remain, assuming that we use this approach, we, I would say that from the standpoint of one who is not going to be involved in doing all of this work, is it feasible to look at the larger task that would come behind this, considering what you've already done, is it feasible to do this for the committee? Sorry, to do what we're outlining here? Yeah. Yeah. I it think, is? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I, what I'd like to do is to minimize my interpretation of what people are thinking. If we could be kind of prescriptive about, you know, let's correct for fasting in this way, or let's, you know, and I don't mind doing it multiple ways, but uh, if you leave it up to me to make interpretations of what you guys are thinking, then I'm afraid I might misunderstand or make mistakes. I think we can offer different ways of possible approaches to interpret the data, show what happens if we substitute one of the late with another one, or resubstitute it again. Mm -hmm. If we say, well, let's lift the ban and then everything goes back to the start again. So we can play around with the data. That's clearly one of the strengths of this approach. Well, and the other thing is, you know, should we be looking at 2003 and 4 data also? I think Russ is perfectly right. Uh, we should first look into the young children and pregnant women data before we do this rather complex approach with enhanced fasting, non-fasting, and so on. I think we have, should have an individual look on this data there. Olger, I agree with you. I think don't go complicated. Do Use a more simple approach because you may find that the value added for going complex may not be worth the time and effort. Well, that data, I think, will probably date back to around 2000 or so, because these were all part of the, I think it was the NIEHS or EPA Children's Centers, which I think all were funded right around 98 to 2000. So that's when the urine samples were taken. Well, un un unless the Vanguard Centers of the Children's Study can get some data We're not going to be really starting in the field again until 2012. January 1st, that's when uh, they expect us to be back in the field. Uh, it, it is quite uh, intuitive to begin with children, but let me, uh, let me remind you that those biological data from Earl and others would actually be more suitable to look at uh, women in reproductive age because what this models is the exposure during the critical male programming window. So I hear already toxicological purists slaughtering the panel if we use those reference values for, for making assumptions about possible hazards to, or risks to children. Yeah. And you see my point? Yeah, exactly, and I think I, th I think the the approach is sound. Um, we can revisit the details, like where, which reference doses, and how they were derived. And uh, Andreas makes a good point. These data are probably best suited for the mothers, the the women of reproductive age. Um, you. You might consider using other reference values for children or other adults or so on, but I'm not sure you could come up with any necessarily come up with any better values. So basically, this is what we have is what you're yeah. saying, and but at least we have to identify the uncertainties around that. Yeah. Okay. Or or just take a. I mean, this the, you did a great job um, illustrating the the process 
uh, we just need to step back and take a look at the, you know, are these the reference doses we want to use, or are there better ones, or so on. Are there any that are children specific? No. Okay. So yeah. basically, you, again, that's an uncertainty we well, have to deal I, with. Yeah. I mean, the panel can derive any factors that they, if, if the data are available, I'm not so sure the data are. Okay. But are the uncertainty factors chosen because, I mean, is there an additional value of 10 to these because of the? Well, I, I, I think what I got from Earl Gray's data is that the fetus is the most uh, sensitive, and then after that, the children or, or the younger males, and then even adults, there are effects, but less and less, uh, le the, the potency is lower, so, or the sensitivity is lower, so um, I think it would be okay to use uh, our reference doses based on the anti-androgenicity for everybody, but just know, understand what it means. I also think uh, I I those data, um, the data they have on the, the developing fetus, they have good recent data. I think the, the data on the um, juvenile animals is, is not really comparable it may not be as good, so I, it may be possible to come up with child-specific uh, RFDs based on juvenile animals, but I, the data probably aren't there. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, it, but it's something we should keep in mind and um, you know maybe take a look at before we go too far. Sure, I'm understanding this, and I, I want to. Um, can we, in, in your in the table that you showed us with case one, case two, that was all derived from animal data, and we have, I assume, similar data relative to the different sensitivities of the the fetus versus. Um, the dam versus uh, I, I don't know what, but could we could we use those differences in the same way that we use this these data to to get at that? No. No, no that's that's unfortunately not not easily done. Uh, what is clear is that you see those those studies. This work was inspired uh, by exploring number one. First of all, defining the so-called male programming window. That's been done by Richard Sharp and uh, Grant uh, Paul Foster. And secondly, then to uh, to first of all qualitatively, rather than in a sense of deriving points of departure, to see whether these phthalates have actually the the effect. That was hypothesized, and that is true. That was the case. Now, <clears throat> so you can, on the basis of this, make some assumptions about the sensitivity of the developing male during the male programming window. To go from there, if you, if you just directly, in a one-to-one -one fashion, applied those kind of data to children, um, then, strictly speaking, you would need to know what exposure their mothers experienced. But that's often not, not available. The only bridge I can see is very recent data from Richard Sharp's lab where he investigated what happens when, <clears throat> when you dose, when you continue to expose uh, male fetuses that were exposed in utero uh, after they were born, whether the effect gets worse or pff, stays the same, etc., etc. But that's still that that would uh, provide additional information, which would still not allow us to make an assumption about sensitivity of children or the risk zone or the hazards to children uh, derived from that kind of data. So, and, I, but I don't understand why not. I mean, we're not <coughs> we're not saying that, that that this is the end of the story. We're mm. saying that we're going to take what information we have, and it's very limited, and it comes mm. from rats. But we're going to apply it to 
the human situation, and we may be we may you know be off by a factor of whatever. That's essentially what we're doing here, isn't it? Yeah, I, I know what you're saying, but the the, the point is that. Uh, the, the toxicological literature, the toxicological data define a period of vulnerability, which is not the young child, but rather... No, I understand that. So... But, I mean, we're, we're arguing about, we're saying that the fetus is more sensitive than yeah. the, the newborn is more sensitive mm -hmm. than a child six years old or older. And don't we have some data from rats to kind of support that? In other words, we know what what doses will create a problem when when the fetus is exposed at the appropriate stage of development. And I thought Earl talked about data that where they had phthalate exposures postnatally. That's right. That's right. That's what so, I mentioned. These are data from. Richard Sharp's lab, but maybe Earl has some as well. No, my point is this. If you um, <clears throat> hypothetically, if you expose a child to levels of phthalates that, if received by a pregnant mother uh, during the first trimester, uh, it, uh, well, if that child hasn't experienced these levels while developing in the womb, uh, it is probably safe. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So because we don't know this, really uh, the, the best way to move forward would first of all be to, <clears throat> to look at uh, women in their reproductive age. But there's no problem with that, is there? No, in terms of choosing women in, in Hanes that are of a yeah, certain age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But would you, are you suggesting to use the same reference doses? Yeah here yeah. as so is I mean is that the point where we were right mm -hmm. that if we had better information we could have actually used different reference doses for different situations but we don't have They're, they don't exist I don't think no well, that's right they don't exist so <clears throat> I'll, I'm, I'm saying is the what you've done is wonderful and uh, these reference doses here can be used for, for women in their reproductive age. That would be the most appropriate thing to do. But it would be ball. I'll throw another curveball. Um, would you? I'll throw, let me, I'll throw a knuckleball then. Um, would it be reasonable to assume also that pregnant mother or the mother, of ch the woman of childbearing age, would be exposed to the same phthalates as would the child after they're born. Because the child after they're born is products X, whereas the mom-to-be could be exposed to products Y. And you may be comparing apples. That's why, that's why it's a straight bowl versus a knuckle bowl. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Paul. Very likely, the uh, child uh, in, in, you know, a one-year-old child wouldn't use cosmetics. Huh? Okay. Right. No, no, but their mother does. But I think there in lies the fact that if we get to too much detail, what I'm trying to say is that the farther, the more finely we try to carve this up in terms of what they've done, what Chris and Holger have done, I think we're going to be faced with the prospect that we're going to be looking at things that we have more uncertainty about other factors than what they did and why they chose the, uh, the fact, the, uh, the RFDs they did. Right? Yeah, because I, I don't see a problem going ahead with where we are. My, my point is this is a good start and we should use yeah. it. No, I, I, my question is, is just this is perfect for women of childbearing age. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to apply it to young children. Um, okay. Beyond that, it's getting dicey. It, it would be probably conservative, but it's getting dicey. I just want to point out that uh, the calculation model Chris presented is, is right now limited 
to children from the age of 3 to 18. Because for this subpopulation we have data to extrapolate from the urinary levels to daily intake. We right now have no calculation basis to extrapolate from urinary levels of children younger than three to daily intake. Probably would go via urine volume per day and so we will have to recheck what data we have. And for women in their reproductive age, a childbearing age, we would have to use a different formula of calculation. Um, just a single part is different, but it would be a different formula, just to point that out. We wouldn't move... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we would need different values there. Not a no. roadblock. No problem. But we would have problems with children younger than three. Because there's very little databases, not in terms of metabolites in urine, but in terms of extrapolating from the urinary level to daily intake. And I assume it's not 24-hour urine data, Russ, it's spot urines. And you know how it is with creatinine in children half a year, a year of age very low, so it's difficult to use that. We would probably go via the urine volume, the daily urine volume, and then we need some data on that. But again, we can be very open in can explain everything, mm -hmm. and it's, it's up to everybody to decide on, upon reliability, uncertainty. Yeah. Well, I, I think when we go through this, the uncertainties are going to pop right out. Yes. Any other comments, questions? Not Mike, do you want can, to? Can I just oh, ask, yeah. so are we saying we're going to try to get data from other people to do this and pregnant women or children? Or are we going to, well, what, how, where are we with that? If, uh, uh, assuming you were still Holger's willing to make estimates, I mean, we could certainly ask for the data on, uh, on children and or pregnant women, and we can ask for the, the uh, individual data um, if you're willing to, to do the calculations. We'll, we'll have to discuss first what kind of data we request. Or what is the, the, the data basis we need, like age of the woman, body weight. Right. So, so yeah. exactly. And we need to check whether all this data is available. Is this equation the correct equation for a pregnant woman? I mean other than the <laughs> other than the creatinine part? There are no studies with pregnant women in terms of uh, urinary metabolism. you know, mm -hmm. there have never been dosages of, of pregnant women. Of course. The, the Trimester versus third. Yeah. I mean, I would think creatinine excretion is going to change a lot, or it's known to. In addition to body weight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that usually goes up. Yeah. So, but I mean, are there ways of informing? I mean, do we, would we, other than adjusting the, the creatinine, the, um, the smooth creatinine excretion, are there other corrections we would make to such a formula for a pregnant woman? We just don't know how reliable it is. Is that what we're saying? Because no. the stu those studies haven't been done. Okay. Any other comments? Paul? I just think that we should just move ahead and learn about what Mike has in terms of data that's available to us because it could help, I think, tailor some of the thoughts that Chris and Holger have been toying with in, her, in their approach.
Okay, this is the work that we did uh, in about 2000. And it's all about uh, DINP. <clears throat> and this is, I think, uh, well, this is, uh, mo I think, mostly about the, the methodology in the approach that we used. Uh, but I think it's still, still relevant to the current situation. Um, but it's only oral exposure. Um, of course, in, in 1998, almost everything that we tested was uh, contained DINP. Uh, and these are essentially um, these are uh, teethers, rattles, and soft plastic toys sold in the U.S. Uh, 99, 98, uh, 90 90% of them contain DINP. Um, and that's just a little bit of history. First there was uh, DEHP, which was replaced by DINP, uh, and so on. Um, and of course, DINP is relatively unique because it's it's a mixture of many different isomers which sort of complicates everything. Uh, it has very low vapor pressure, lower than most of the other phthalates. It's less soluble and more hydrophobic than even uh, most of the other phthalates. So what did we do? We surveyed um, the soft plastic teethers and toys for DINP uh, in the amount. We measured migration rates in the laboratory. Um, this uh, method, uh, it was uh, calibrated against adult volunteers. We also did an observation study with uh, children uh, up to 36 months old, which looked at uh, mouthing behavior and then did a uh, pro uh, probabilistic analysis f for children by different age and in different products. Um, these are just some of the toys that we're dealing with. Um, this is the apparatus. This was first developed by the Dutch um, and later adopted by the uh, European Commission. Um, you take a disc, a 10 square centimeter disc uh, punched out from the, the product. You immerse it in a saliva simulant or saline solution, whatever. Uh, it's tumbled uh, in this apparatus at 60 RPMs for a certain amount of time, half an hour. You collect the, collect the solvent. Um, you add fresh uh, solution, to repeat it, um, and then uh, when you're done, you combine them, measure the amount of uh, DINP in the, in the solution. Um, and this was validated, uh, well, I'll explain that in a minute. This just shows the migration rates as a percentage of DINP. Um, there's a, a lot of scatter. Nor, you would expect that all things being equal, that the migration rate would increase with the concentration. But obviously, with DINP, not all things are equal. Uh, the, there are different manufacturing processes. There are different uh, uh, additives. Uh, I'm not sure what's actually accounting for the difference, uh, except that it. Uh, it's there. Um, these were uh, validated against or calibrated against uh, studies with uh, volunteers, human adult volunteers. Uh, there were several of these studies done. The, the Dutch did the first. Uh, a typical study has uh, 10 or 20 adult volunteers. They're given a PVC disc, which they mouth for one hour. Now the, the instructions are to to 
um, mouth suck or gently chew this disc. It's broken up into four 15-minute sessions and you collect the person's saliva um, and analyze for the uh, uh, phthalate. Um, there's also in the 15-minute sessions, there's, there are breaks and there's also a session with a, a Teflon blank. Um, some of these use actual toys. Some of them used a standard disc that was prepared with, uh, that contained a, a known amount of DINP. And so this shows some results from four studies. Now these are the migration rates uh, are scaled uh, divided by the mean to put them on, uh, to make them equivalent, but it's, it's just remarkable uh, that they're, they're very consistent once you make that observation or make, make that uh, uh, correction. Um, it just struck me as, as uh, uh, very consistent and they're, uh, of course, log normally distributed. Um, so, the migration data, now this is, uh, at, you know, 10 years ago they were almost all DINP. By this time, 42% um, of them, only 42% of the toys that we tested contained DINP. Get a migration rate. Um, and then we also, uh, what we did, we added a factor. Um, the, when the, the, the Dutch and the European Commission developed this method this had, uh, for measuring migration in the laboratory, they adjusted the conditions so that the migration rate uh, in the laboratory would correspond to the 95th percentile of the hum in the human studies, um, in, and um, that was their uh, that was their choice. So here, what we did was we took data from one of the volunteer studies with the standard disk, uh, got the migration rate with the volunteers, and a, mig a migration rate by the laboratory method came up with a ratio of 0.28. So um, in other words, we're adjusting to the, the mean to the mean instead of the 95th percentile to the mean. My, the observation study, uh, 169 children um, from 3 to 36 months randomly selected in, in two uh, metropolitan area areas. We had trained observers. Uh, there's a couple of studies where they have the parents make all the observations. We sent trained uh, observers to the children's, either their homes or their daycare, wherever they were. Uh, we did a, a, a total of 12 20-minute observations over a two-day period. They recorded uh, everything that the child uh, mouthed, including the frequency and the duration. We did have the parents record uh, the time, because they were the only ones present for the entire day, the uh, time that the child was awake and not eating, uh, presumably because they're not mouthing while they're asleep, and of course, when they're eating, they can't. So what we ended up with, uh, or uh, this is, um, okay, so for all except pacifiers, uh, the youngest children averaged 70 minutes per day and it declines as they get older. When you start looking at specific products like plastic teethers and rattles or soft plastic toys, the times actually are, are very surprisingly low on the order of a, a, a minute per day. Um, what the children mouth on most, uh, more than anything, is their fingers. Um, then pacifiers, 
then teethers and toys, and then after that it, it, it drops off. So, you know, previously we had been using, um, you know, estimates of hours per day of mouthing time, and some people uh, are still using, for risk assessment purposes, assuming an, an hour per day or more. Um, this is just for soft plastic toys, for the different age groups, the means, a um, couple of minutes per day. Um, the 90, here, the 95th percentile is, is still under 10 minutes. Um, the medians, in fact, were zero because on a given day, less than half of the children were actually mouthing or observed to mouth those particular toys. So we calculated the daily exposure based on the migration rate of the product measured in the laboratory. This is the correction factor. This is the standard disk migration rate in the human volunteers versus the laboratory. This is the mouthing time in minutes per hour that the child mouthed the particular article and the time uh, that they're awake each day and divided by the body weight. So you basically do a sampling uh, Monte Carlo kind of an uh, analysis. Now some of these are uh, the mouthing time, the minutes, it's minutes per hour is dependent on the product, the child's age and months in the, in the product. The exposure time depends on those things as well, and the, and the body weight depends on the child's age in months. So we did all the sampling and came up with these estimates for children 3 to 11 months old. Uh, we're talking about mean even 95th, even 99th percentile exposures uh, going up to uh, on the order of a microgram per kilogram per day. Now this is assuming 40% uh, of the toys contain DINP. And you can do the same thing as assuming, uh, do the calculation assuming that they all contain DINP, which was the case some time ago. So. Uh, well, the key assumptions, uh, well, we applied migration rates from one product to another because I didn't think that really mattered. Uh, you know, in all of these studies, in, in the human studies and interpreting them, you're collecting their saliva. So we're assuming that absorption through the, the oral uh, mucosa is negligible. And we also, well, we didn't estimate dermal exposure in, in uh, this case. Um, the limitations, well, is vary, there's a lot of variability. It's not so much uncertainty as variability in the migration rates and mouthing times. And, uh, well, for our overall conclusions, we were only looking at one phthalate in one, uh, a narrow a narrower range of products. Um, so now, uh, here we are. Uh, we're here, it's in, in now winter. Um, so I wanna just quickly bring up another, a few more slides that shows the, uh, the more recent work that we did. going to skip the flame retardants.
Yeah, I can't. Um, but there's go to uh, Yeah, I can't I don't see slideshow. Uh maybe. Well, in that case. Uh, I, I I accidentally copied the PDF instead of the. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I hear you. Okay. So, we already know this. Um, we already know the. About the three permanently prohibited in the the interim prohibition, um, and so let's look at exposure studies. We collected sixty three toys and child care articles, uh, and we collected these a couple of months before the the ban actually became effective. And we identified the plastics and plasticizers. And we measured the plasticizer concentration and migration. So we don't really need that. Um, and 10 years ago, almost everything was PVC and had DINP. You can see now that. PVC is now about a, a third of the plastic toys, soft plastic toys that we tested. There's a variety of other plastics, uh, most of which don't require a plasticizer. Of the PVC products, of course, now that the phthalates are banned, and this is actually just before the ban, this is one DINP product, which would be still allowed because it's not, uh, it, because it can't fit in a child's mouth. The DEHP is one that now would be banned. Um, and as far as the plasticizers go, uh, ATBC, acetyl tributyl citrate, is probably the biggest, followed by this is the para-isomer or terephthalate version of DEHP. Uh, DINCH is, uh, if you take DINP and reduce the, the ring, so instead of an aromatic ring, you have a cyclohexane. TXIB is a plasticizer. It's not really a plasticizer. It's used in combination with other plasticizers. Um, it's not used by itself, but it was in, present in a significant portion of the products, uh, a few benzoates. Um, and, and in fact, most of the products that we tested had more than one of these. Some of them had as many as three. Um, you've already seen that. These are the migration rates. This was interesting because uh, DINCH is actually r pretty similar to what DE, DINP was. Um, and the other thing that struck me here, there is some difference in the migration rates among the different ones. Uh, for most of these, they, the, the uh, concentration of the plasticizer seems to correlate pretty well, or the migration rate seems to correlate pretty well with the uh, with the percentage, um, but DINCH is more like we found with DINP. It's it's kind of all over the place. The others are, are uh, much more uh, better correlated. Um, and let's see, I didn't. Okay, I didn't show 
all the data. This is really all that I have um, on, on the, these slides. But the other thing that we did besides the migration data that I shown, we did wipe samples of the toys to estimate uh, dermal that we could use to estimate dermal exposure. So we've got a set of toys, and I'm just presenting the summary data. We've got the individual toys in, in any level of detail you want, um, um, toys and other kinds of things that the, the kids, uh, things that would qualify as child care articles under the new uh, regulations. Um, and the question is whether we need more um, uh, more data or some other kind of uh, migration study that we don't have, but it's a it's a start. And you know the the issue we had with the with the last chap is the data weren't ready until the chap was already done. This way, we wanted to do at least get started on it before you. Uh, came together um, so you, at least you would have some data to work with. Comments, questions? Holger? Yes. Mike, probably I asked you the question last time already. What is the reason for the human versus lab correction factor? Yes. Well, the when they developed the study, that method, they adjusted the conditions of the laboratory, the time and volume and so on, to correspond to the 95th percentile uh, or the upper end of the, the volunteers. And you saw it was very skewed distribution. Here, we, we did that factor to, so it would be a one-to-one, -one basically. Um, and then we, um, because we were doing a probabilistic exposure assessment, so we didn't have to worry about um, being conservative. So would, would the lab have under or overestimated the exposure as it has been found in the human studies? Well, the, by this method, it, it, it's nominally the same. Um, the one possible source was with the humans, if they were, um, if some of the DINP were absorbed through the, the, um, the lining of the mouth, then that would, could cause a, a, an underestimation. Uh, we, well, we convinced ourselves that that wasn't likely. Um, that, but that's not a fact. Did you check for Metabolic activity in the saliva? Uh, no. You no. know that and saliva that's enough? is full of esterases, for example? Yeah. So you might produce monoesters in saliva? Um, we, no one, at that time, no one tested for that. Because I, I think one should at least measure the monoester to check whether... Because my suspicion is that... Uh, a lot of the DINP, DHP, or DINJ will be broken down already if you chew it for 15 minutes in the saliva. Even in 15? Yeah, yeah, pretty fast. So I just want to yeah. add these comments to maybe... Feed. Yeah, 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 definitely. Can you put up the, the slide again that had the... Didn't you have... Estimates in, mic in micrograms yeah. per kilogram per day, what those values are? I'll put this one up. This is assuming that all of the toys, teether and teethers and so on contain 
DINP. So I just, I couldn't, there's a problem with doing things quickly and, you know, I could have made an error, but what I, what I just did while you were talking was look at um, the estimated daily intake for DINP from the calculations that, that I showed you all. Um, and th now this is for older kids, six to 18, six through 18. But um, there's somebody with a very high value, you know, 4,800 yeah. micrograms. But the, the median is actually 7.1. The mean is huge, so the mean is 18 and a half. But the median, so if you think about 7.1 is the median DI, daily intake for DINP, um, that might be micrograms micrograms per kilogram per day yeah and, and of course this is just from mouthing toys so my but the point is so here the average exposure sorry the average daily intake for DINP is estimated at 7.2 yeah. but you know a, a third of that is the 99 percentile for 2012 to 2030 months and that's different ages and all that you know I know I'm apples yeah, and oranges yeah. Okay, for Assuming that this is right. So, no, if you use them, so I mean, that might get... So if you, if you use the mean in 3 to 11 month old, right, and you use the higher level, it's about 10% of the total daily. Right, because you said it was seven. Right. The median is seven. Oh, the mean. The mean, the mean is eighteen and a half. All right. Well, then. It's yeah, so it's even less. It's even less. Right. <clears throat> I just would like to cite something. Salivary glands also secrete salivary lipase. A more potent form of lipase to start for fat digestion. Lipase plays a large role in fat digest digestion in newborns, as the pancreatic lipase has still some time to develop. So I think if we look at newborns and young children, we have to assume that they have strong lipase activity in the mouth, and that therefore any extracted DINP is fastly metabolized to MINP or other monoesters. And we would have to assume that in some way, additional to the mucose yeah. resorption. Well, I think that is exactly my yeah, opinion. But in an in but but in an infant, uh, w once it migrates, we're assuming that the infant this migrates out, and we're assuming that the infant swallows all of that. And it doesn't matter at once it's in, in the mouth. I mean, uh, uh, once it's in the mouth, it doesn't matter if it gets metabolized in the saliva or in the gut or whatever. What's a concern is in the adult studies, it, it's a concern. Yes. Uh, for the kids, it doesn't matter. It's just an additional point of remark. So you would have to... to uh, correct for the lipase activity, or at least you would have to measure the monoester in these I studies. I don't understand too. why. I mean, you're you're putting a level of detail on here that's unnecessary. No, you are uh, doing a, t a big mistake if you only measure the diester in the saliva because what it might already. What he's saying here is this is the estimate of exposure from the toys before anything's metabolized. Anything. Yes, it is based on the human saliva data, where you measured the diester. If 50 or 70 percent of diester is already cleaved to the monoester, you underestimate the result. They're measuring the diester, and it's quickly cleaved, probably almost instantaneously, in a in an infant's or child's mouth to the monoester. Okay. So the chemical analysis 
will miss the monoester because it's measuring the diester. But this yeah, is a hypothetical measurement. This is not real. Th this In isn't saliva. This isn't saliva. The These are um, phosphate buffered saline right. or that's something. That's what it is. That's it's not the saliva. adults. It's saliva. Right. right. The adult one with the saliva. Yeah. Well, with this is not with the adults, that's a, an issue. Not on this. Not on this data. Exactly, Paul. That's exactly why I asked the question, what is the difference between the lab and the human study? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. okay, if you're asking that question, yes, but I think what you're interpreting from it is not, not correct. But the lab study, there's no light bases. Exactly. Right. So I was interested in the difference. Obviously, there has been a difference yeah. which needed to be corrected for. And I would have been interested in the reason for this. Well, the, I mean, the... Um, I, I think I misunderstood the question, but um, what they did was they actually did the humans, the Dutch did the human studies first and then developed a method that would uh, approximate the human studies. Right. But if the... A laboratory if method. The, if the assumption has been wrong in the beginning, you cannot develop a lab method which is based on the wrong data. Exactly. Yeah. Measured yeah. in the saliva is undermeasured because you're not measuring. I mean, Maybe. a lot of the diester is converted to the monoester, Maybe and then you're the using that study. to model the in the, in the human, human study. study. Yeah, and then you're using that to model the hypothetical or um, done by machine, I guess, right? That was just one point to to, exp or to illustrate. I, I still know where, let me know one, before you get off that one point. I still know where you're going with this. I mean, this is a hypothetical DIMP exposure from plastic toys, right? Explain to me what your point is with respect to those numbers. Okay, do it stepwise. Um, yes, I'd like to hear. So the, that you're confusing me. Yeah. <laughs> If you're confusing so, me, you'll confuse others. Yeah. So, so my introductory question was why there was this factor relating lab to human results. Obviously, there is a difference. Yes. A big difference in the human approach compared to the lab model is that the lab saliva is missing lipase. Mm -hmm. So in the human study, if you assumed lipase activity, you would assume that the diester is cleaved to the monoester. In the human study, only the diester has been measured. If you don't measure the monoester, you're underestimating the, the migration of the diester from the product. How fast does that migration, and how fast does that transfer occur? It's, it's, just, it's just hydrolysis, right? So it's seconds. I mean, once there's contact between the enzyme and the diester, it's a simple chemical reaction. So I would I would think it would occur. There's often in kinetics involved, but let's let's face it. Uh, you you mouth this object for a couple of minutes mm -hmm. at 37 degrees, ideal temperature for for uh, enzyme activity. Has anyone, not, has anyone done that experiment? That's the issue. Probably nobody has. So we're making an assumption, one way or the other. I'm, I think you're making the wrong assumption from the beginning on, that you don't assume the cleavage of the diester. Because that would be the first and most logical step to occur, in my opinion. Or us is, I think it's, uh, there is lipase activity in saliva. I brought that up because you, uh, because Mike uh, said they modeled the membrane take up or the mucous membrane that the mucous membrane would, would play a role. I would say if you introduce the mucous membrane, you would definitely have to introduce the lipase activity. I think we should go back to the original report and see what they.
I want to find out what the assumptions were, whether they made any corrections, and how, because right now all we're doing is debating hypotheticals. We need to look at the original yeah. approach that they used and why they did, why the, why the ratio they selected is what it is. This gets back to some of the discussion items on our draft agenda. Uh, who will do what? And it sounds like one of the things is that Mike will provide protocols and, and data studies to Holger and Chris. Um, mm -hmm. What other uh, talked about data for pregnant women? So, Russ, you're going to provide well, these contact. references and. Yeah, well, Yeah, or, I mean, or the contact directly from Mike and CPSC. I yeah, but I could work with you in identifying the three or four cohorts and asking for original data. And then, as Hogar mentioned, we'd want to know, you know, which variables, you know, in terms of age and body weight, etc., that they would supply with the data. I can do that. Any other assignments that we've implicitly made or explicitly made? Here it goes. <laughs> so, you want me to push it down? So, um, we look at have someone look at the those tables that we're assuming values from and see if there's any improved corrections or very I mean do we do we want to just go with what we've got do we want to try to improve those values the ones that we set are there better values for those yeah I mean where did did you Calculate them from Earl Gray's data, or are they from? It is literally taken from either Earl Gray's data, Earl Gray's testimony, or Earl Gray's presentation at the second meeting. Okay. Indicated it was five milligrams per kilogram per day, and that they were equipotent. And that's what why okay. they all have five. And then the relative potency was there as well, the 0.15 relative potency. Did that come from them? Yes. That's what he said, and that's what in the testimony. I'm trying to read the five. Was that a Noel, Lowell, or uh, it was a Noel? The Noel. Okay. Questions on the table from Chris as to whether we just want to go with this in our scenario modeling or do we want to entertain more discussion about whether we should change these assumptions or these values we might again ask Earl for his opinion we might ask Andreas again for his opinion I, <clears throat> I, I think this, this was very helpful, productive, and instructive, and I, I think we should go ahead along those lines. But I'm a little mindful of uh, the other aspect of tomorrow, uh, this morning's discussions, that is back to the problem definition step. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to do a little more looking at the charge. And I guess we need to reflect a little more on what precisely um, Chris's and Holger's work is good for. In what way does it help us address the charge? Mm -hmm. Mike, do you have slides you can put up? Charge. Um, for the charge. Um, I might. <clears throat> Let's have a coffee break. <laughs> okay. 
while Mike is looking for this. Let's uh, try to be back in, in, in 10, 15 minutes, please. <laughs>